the eastern fringe. Ever a realm barely touched by imperial influence. It was initially the least affected by the fall of the Imperium no petty Imperia ever formed from the ashes of imperial rule in the eastern fringe. The area merely became marginally more anarchic and barbarous. However, the devastation of High Fleet Kraken, and later High Fleet Talos, ravaged the fringe horrendously. Soon after, the new Devara surged from the west, murdering thousands of world. A hundred dozen civilizations were wiped out, and when the various hordes of monsters left the fringe was utterly fragmented. Countless worlds were left as nothing but bare rock. Of course, as with most genocides and disasters, history and life did not disappear. Some races, and even empires, managed to evade destruction either through guile, luck or sheer blood-mindedness. The largest of the surviving empires was the Tau Empire. In fact, because the Tau did not rely upon the deep warp for travel, the crippling warp storms throughout the galaxy did little to hamper them. With little opposition, the Tau embarked upon multiple expansions, on multiple fronts. Their optimism and hope seemed frankly surreal to the crippled, dying civilizations around them. However, this idealism and hope soon faded, just like everything else. Everywhere they tried to bring the greater good was dead. The Tau expanded into their inheritance. They were, however, inheriting a galaxy of ash. Ash and cold misery, sometime around M43. During the 18th and 19th sphere expansions, Tau policy began to subtly change. The Ethereals no longer recommended offering civilizations the chance to join the greater good. It was decided, at the Orn Council of 234, M43 presided over by Ornva himself, that the other races of the galaxy were hopelessly barbarous. The other races allowed their worlds to die, they made war with each other, even when unity would be the best option in the wake of such an atrocity. In short, they must be forced into submission, and their people ruled over by the only beings capable of logical, spiritual thought the ethereals. By 003, M44, a dozen decades into the hundredth sphere expansion, the Tau Empire stretched from the dead worlds of Itcher to the barren howling worlds of Alsanta. In total, it spanned roughly two dozen sectors, and comprised just over a thousand worlds. Perhaps 55% of these worlds were dead. And during the slow, agonizing process of terraforming involving constant bombardment with bioengineered algae and various petroid plant accelerants, which nonetheless took millennia to make worlds fully habitable the Tau had become slightly more xenophobic. For instance, clan races were forbidden from electing leaders of the various September systems and were confined to the poorest habitations upon world. This was the Tau Empire, and the Tau wanted everyone to understand this. The other races were inferior as they had ruined paradise with their wars. Communication was slow but frequent in this expanded Tau Empire. Without astropaths, they relied on the billions of communication drones and messenger boats which pulsed near constantly between septs, only leaving the shallow warp when delivering messages. As the Empire's borders advanced, so did its technology. Their ships became more heavily armed and protected than ever before. Limited cloning and genetic technology allowed greater medical care, with each Tau having access to multiple cloned blood samples, limbs, and even eyes. Drone technology gained greater and greater sophistication, and the first entirely drone-controlled battle computer was released in 103. M44, pulse weaponry became more reliable and effective, and gunships and battlesuits of unprecedented quality were invented during this period. In the Segmentum Tempestus, the Tau were at the center of power. Yet, for all its unity and promise, the Tau Empire could not maintain a completely centralized empire, despite their best efforts. Space was too vast, and their vessels too slow. Some septs were barely visited by the central authorities, while others had vast horn control set upon them. However, most continued to follow the greater good according to Ornva and the Orthodox Council of the Ethereal. There were, however, two major exceptions. The Enclaves, Tau colonies cut off from the Empire by warp anomalies in late M41, became all the more isolated in the 42nd millennium as the anomaly became a raging warp storm. It was not until M43 that news of the Enclaves were heard, and they had changed markedly. Without the Ethereals, the Enclaves became a realm dominated by the far cast. The greater good, as a concept, had been rejected by these Tau. Only grim resolve and a strong arm allowed survival in a hostile galaxy. The caste system was virtually abolished, and inter-caste mingling was not outlawed. Only the fire caste, the new military elite, remained aloof of caste interbreeding. However, though not enforced, 
The caste system remained in spirit, as each caste intrinsically distrusted the other. Even more strangely, the Farsight enclaves now operated under a sort of decentralized vassal system. Territories upon enclave worlds were carved up between the new caste within a caste, the Shaskaza. Each of these powerful warlords had acquired battle suits, and each of these Kaza maintained their own little fiefdom. They maintained men of fire caste soldiers as their vassals. Each of these feasts sheltered other caste members, on the assumption they would provide a tax to their lords, in exchange for protection. The Shaskaza, in turn owed allegiance to the Shasashovakaza, the overall Grand Kaza of the Enclaves. For many centuries this rank was held by Farsight himself, however, after his death this rank passed to his sons, and became, in effect, hereditary though through the centuries. The position of Grand Kaza has been disputed and the line of succession is a tangled web far too complex to go into here. Upon the passing of a Grand Kaza, the ceremonial armor of Farsight is granted to them, and they are anointed Grand Kaza, by kissing the hilt of the Dawn Blade, the symbol of Enclave Liberty a blade no longer drawn by Enclave Tau, but instead enshrined within Farsight's tomb upon the world of Fio Monterra. To survive, the Enclaves abandoned the concept of refining their technology. Instead, they relied on trade between rival empires and between merchants and the like. Thus, the enclaves became a melting pot of differing technologies, all utilized by the Khazar in order to survive. Though not as technologically advanced as their town neighbors, the enclaves have large numbers of fire cast warriors and a willingness to use Xenos equipment should the need arise. For instance, there are several occasions where enclave troopers have been seen wielding imperial lasguns and carapace armor, deconial nanocrystalline armor, digital weapons or other such gear. These in conjunction with Tau technology and some strange hybridization of technology. So far, it has kept them relatively powerful and resistant to sporadic Tau Empire assaults. The second subversive element came into being much later. By M43, the Empire was in full expansive operations. However, it took several centuries until a process of colonization and organization of water cast administration could be fully implemented on every September world and system. One such neglected September colony was the Token September, located on the northern border of Tau expansion across the fringe, and one of the most distant colonies in the Empire. Though a verdant world, it was colonized late on, as the Orn were only being able to spare a single exploration fleet to inhabit it. To bolster numbers in the colonial army, many Guvisa auxiliary troops were utilized. Token was subdued by this combined force, though the battle was difficult, due to the fanatical resolve of the native warrior Huster. A human tribal culture that made excellent use of captured Tau equipment during the year-long invasion. On case, the commanding ethereal on the expedition, was so impressed with the Huster's abilities that he offered them roles within the occupying Tau forces. Though the Tau firecast were skeptical of these uncivilized warriors, the Guvisa took to them very well. Instructing them on the philosophies of the greater good and training them in the use of Tau equipment even though the Huster had utilized much of the Tau equipment already, during the war. In turn, the Huster explained how they worship the Great White Serpent, and also taught the Guvisa some of their ambush techniques and unique battle tactics. As the colony became less and less visited by the Tau Central Authority, Onkase became more and more reliant upon his various Guvisa subjects to fend off threats to his colony. Though the expedition was well staffed by water, earth and air cast, the far cast scent had been a smaller number to begin with. The wars against the Huster depleted them further and over the centuries. The Fire Warriors became less and less viable as a fighting force as their numbers weren't being replaced as well as their Guvisa Hester allies could. The Guo of the Hester contingent, Bald and Ra, got closer to Wonkase than any other commander. The two often consulted one another upon tactics and strategies. Wonkase would often get advice from Balden on how to keep the majority of the human population of the September colony appeased. As a result, Wonkase would entrust more and more duties to them. The Huster converted to the philosophy of the greater good rather well, incorporating their serpent god into the myriad meanings of it. Upon the death of Onkase, a dispute broke out among the remaining subordinate Ethereal. Several of them recommended themselves for the role of overall colonial leader. There was an important distinction between the two main groups that built up amongst the Ethereal. There were the traditionalists, who argued that upon becoming Supreme September Orn, the far cast should be put in overall command of defense once more. The other group were the pro Gu, who believed the Guvisa had been doing a perfectly fine job of defending the realm. In the end, through honor duels, personal and public elections, and outright intrigue, the pro Gu group got their wish, and Balden remained overall military commander. 
Oddly for the traditionalists, Baldwin's supporters were not just from the Guvisa and the general human population, but also from the majority of the earth and water castes. The successor to the Ownship of the September fell to Onjkara. As it would transpire, this ethereal was rather weak as a leader and was virtually a puppet for Baldwin and his successors. By the time more regular contact had been established by the Tau Empire with Token, in 335 M46, it was barely recognizable as a Tau September world. Humans and Tau were almost treated as equals, with the Tau filling in most non-military roles, while the militant Gu caste sat on the Council of Castes and fought at the front of most assaults. While the only fire caste remaining piloted the battlesuits tailored as they were, for Tau alone, Chief Commander Moonat of the Tau Empire forces, even requested permission to invade Token, and cleanse it of its perceived subversion of the greater good. Ornva however, vetoed this plan, and decided to instead recognize the right of Token, nicknamed the Human Colony, as being part of the Empire. This was mainly because the Huster had completely converted to the greater good, only their brutal tribal war clubs wielded in battle by every Huster Guvisa remained of their old culture. The Guvisa contingent were there to stay, and would eventually become a key ally to the Tau Empire in the long war against the Thexan elite which will be documented at a later date. Right, so let me put this out here right now before I start talking. Um, I don't like the tie. I'm not a big fan of them. I don't like the space commies. I'm not interested in it. All that. Um, I don't know. They just don't do it for me. I'm really not interested. But this actually made the tie sound pretty fucking cool to me. And what I really liked was, now correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of felt like the fire cast was tart, like, you know, they were comparing them to, like, you know, the samurai almost. And then these new human regiments were, like, the Imperial Japanese Army. You know, I'm sure we'll maybe see something like that down the road. Although I do have a bit of a soft spot for the last samurai. I'm not a big Tom Cruise fan, but, like, look, it was a good movie. It's like Dancing with Wolves, but the Japanese edition. Go check it out if you haven't seen it. But, look, um, also... I need to get this out here as well. I don't like to keep you too long at the end, but like, you know, look, I need to get it out. And there is 30 parts to this story. So, and that's only Warmer 50k. Then after the 30 parts, it then hits Warmer f fucking 60k. So, look, uh, I'm going to have to make the videos a lot bigger. I'm going to maybe be after putting like three parts in together at a time. You know, it, it's also a good size for you to be able to digest them, because 10 minutes can be a bit short, whereas, like, you know, if I maybe put three videos together, maybe that comes up to about half an hour to 45 minutes or so, so, like, you know, just a heads up, and also, it's a good way to just get the content out to you guys, because with it being such a big story, it's very, very difficult to actually get it finished, and get it finished in a timely manner that you guys aren't waiting months and months for, so, like, we'll just see how this turns out, I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, I, I really enjoy this. I, I was using this, as I said before, for Head Cannon for a very long time. And, oh yeah, of course, the music that I'm using, it's in the comments down below. Check it out. I've got tons of comments asking for it, and no one seems to look. But, anyway, talk to you boys later. Hope you enjoyed. And, yeah, I know, I've went on for long enough. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!